How much of a pain is it to make husky tails? Not bad anymore. <laughs> I found a new hell in life. It's called dragon wings. Husky tails are like a joke now. Um, they're a bit more of a pain than other tails to make, um, just because there's so many little pieces. Uh, in order to get a fox tail, it's like yeah. five pieces of fur. And a husky tail is like six because it's little piece, so to little piece, so to little piece, because each little piece has a little curve in it, so you have to make a ton of little pieces to get the curl right, otherwise it's where the fur is going in the wrong direction. So. How long have you been doing this? Um, so I became a furry in 2009. Um, I started making suits part-time about mid-2009, and I went full-time pro in 2011, so I've been making full suits. That's my only job for two years. How many suits have you done rough guess? 50, 100? I think I'm getting close to the 100 mark. Um, I bought a package of Kama Crazy labels to sew into my suits, and I think I bought 100 of them, and I just ran out and restocked, so I, since making labels, which I've made uh, several suits before I bought the labels, I at least made 50. <laughs> How long have you been making costumes in general? Oh, um, well, <laughs> that's hard to say. <laughs> Since high school, if you count like where I'd like make the crappy Sailor Moon out of t-shirts and stuff. <laughs> um, 2001 probably is when I started doing it and not looking ridiculous. <laughs> you know, when I used actual patterns and it wasn't just like hot glue and, <laughs> and sheer will to make the thing stay together. <laughs> What's the most complex one you've made? Um, that is sort of a tie between that fabric dragon I made, Grail. The it's I made it four or five months ago. Like back in, I finished it just before May. And well, I figured dragon be up there for one of those. Yeah, and it, was, it, was, it wasn't so much that the dragon was a challenge, it was the fact that it was made out of fabric. Fur is very forgiving. You can screw up or have little you know, wrinkles in the fur and you totally can't tell. Fabric, it shows through everything. And every, it's just, oh, that thing. Like, uh. So that was probably one of the more complicated. The other one on tie with that was the char I made this year for the San Diego Comic Con. Um, that one was just muscle padding everywhere. <laughs> it, it was several pieces. I had to make separate legs and then a separate body because there was so much muscle padding on it because I'm like all of 5'3". <laughs> and I had to look like a giant muscly male char, so I had to pad every conceivable part on my body. The only parts that were padded was this part of my torso and the backs of my thighs. The head, the face, well, the head was actually out here. My head was in the back of the neck, so my vision was just this little screen <laughs> about a foot from my face. You should have put, a, have put like an LCD screen in there and cameras. Uh, it was complex enough. <laughs> I didn't want to make it worse. It wasn't bad, like vision wasn't bad, but it was just so much stuff. Yeah, it's kind of hard to move. Mm -hmm. Definitely need a handler for yeah, that. Yeah, but that one, that would ties with the dragon, mostly because it was just so many little complicated bits, because you had yeah. to put on a muscle suit, and then I had to put on the fur parts, and then it all had leather armor, and then there was a complex way to put on the head, and there was a bungee in the back to hold the head up, because it's so front heavy, mm -hmm. and then there was four screw-in horns, and it was just things. Things and more things. Yeah, so it was, it was, it was complex. Like, I knew what I was going to do for the entire thing, but it just took so much time to do. So yeah, there you go. Dragons and chars are the most. <laughs> what are the easiest? The easiest? Um, I can probably make a fox in my sleep at this point. <laughs> nice. Foxes and wolves are just like. Eh. The, uh, well, there's like wolves are so many. So it's... That's that's the thing. Almost almost any maker worth their salt if they don't know how to make a fox and a wolf. They. You know, they're, like, really, they're really similar differences. How, like how could and you colors. be yeah, in the business? Because yeah, that's that's what you get mostly requested for. So you get very good at making specific things. Dragons, 
or sorry, wolves, foxes, and tigers. <laughs> So I don't know if you want to go into this here, but what do you do? You work off of a duct tape dummy? Do you work off measurements? Uh, duct tape dummy. Okay. I can work on measurements, but I hate it. And the uh, digi grade, I refuse to. Mm -hmm. um, mostly because it's with measurements, it can be done, but it's so finicky, picky. It just wastes my time. With a duct tape dummy, I can have this bodysuit made in a day. Without a duct tape dummy, it's like two or three days because there's so much more finicky measuring. Yeah. So. Duct tape dummies is basically like getting a, uh, at least from what I've seen online, you kind of get uh, like final pajamas almost and just duct tape around every single thing and you cut yourself out of it. That's exactly what it is. Uh, a lot of people use painting smocks because they're light and easy and cheap. You go to the, your local Oh, you mean, store. you mean the uh, painting jumpsuits? Yeah, those. Yeah, and you just pull one on and get your friends to take you off and then. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people that probably wouldn't mind that. Although you have to be worried about some getting duct taped to the wall. <laughs> I've actually seen that someone was actually doing that. I see the pictures and then posted it below. It says, yeah, you need to have real trustworthy friends. I was stuck like this for about three hours. but showed them duct tape to the wall in one of those things. Never had that problem, though I do have people write stuff on you when you're trapped. Yeah. Like my, my latest duct tape dummy says temps boobs on the front and then yeah. insert tail in the back. And it was just like, cut me out, guys, quit it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, you really have to trust the person who's taping you up. Especially if you have to pee. <laughs> yeah. Lesson learned. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you go oh. before. Bro, to life tip, life hack. That's well, I'm, no, I'm, I'm one of those people I anticipate problems like that. <laughs> yeah. No, if you, you don't think you have to go, you go. Just, just. So, especially when you're being, you know, incapacitated for up to and including 20 minutes. <laughs> so it's not too bad. 20 minutes is not too bad. No, I've, I've no. seen some people take several hours to make yeah. a duct tape dummy. So. No, it depends on how old the duct tape you have. <laughs> exactly. No, you actually do part of yourself. Yeah, you can do it from about here to yourself. And then after that, you can no longer twist. Mm -hmm. That's you need help. Exactly. All right, sorry. Go ahead. So uh, how profitable is your business? Uh, I can make a living off of it, but it would be a far poorer living if I wasn't married. Um, I make about, last year I made about 20,000 after materials. Like I made about 40,000 last year. But after But that. when you take out all of the stuff I paid for, Chemicals like resin, expanding foam, uh, duct tape, thread, faux fur, foam. Like, you buy so much stuff to make suits that literally half of my costs were shipping and materials. Mm -hmm. It also depends on the kind of the fur suit you actually have as well. Some of those ones that breathe really well are expensive per foot. Yeah, no, I, I don't buy NFT fur, but yeah, NFT fur is probably the most expensive fur you can buy. That's 30 to 40 dollars per square foot. So this is 30 to 40 dollars. Um, I'm not a high-end suit maker, so I don't use that fur, but some of the suit makers that do, like um, Beetle Cat uses it a bit, and uh, Papa Creature uses it all the time. That's why their suits are so expensive, because yeah. materials. You're paying this You're, much for a square it's foot. About, those ones, if I remember correctly, about 10 to 20 grand, depending on what you want made. Um, I. Don't know if she's charged twenty grand, but five to six well, thousand dollars. I've, I've seen some ones, average starting. I've seen some ones that actually have a full coolant system inside there and everything else that can help with, help with it. So. Some do. Um, personally, I don't think they're very. Um, they're not, cooling systems aren't a great idea. I'm fine with a fan in the head, but once you start putting in cooling vests and stuff, um, cooling vests can actually cause a heart attack. Something about warm blood going into a cold chest can make your heart seize up. So this is why most professional sport mascots and um, suits like for uh, TV, or TV or movie, you know, Guillermo del Toro type creature shows, they don't wear cooling vests for that specific reason. It actually puts their body into shock. So it's better to just have a head fan and just have some circulation for the air and then just take frequent breaks than it is to put in a cooling vest and risk a heart attack. Even the, uh, even the uh, professional grade ones that you can get from recycles? Even the professional grade ones have a risk of heart attack. It's a risk I'm not willing to take. <laughs> 
you know, if, if someone requests it, I will make space in their suit so they can wear one. But I would never ever provide one for that specific reason. Mm -hmm. But yes, when you buy those, you're adding up the cost as well. Yeah. Well, generally, just to make expands a little bit more, make an extra slit. Pretty much. Uh, the, I did for one fellow. Um, he wanted that extra room just in case he wanted to buy a cooling fan. So I made him like um, a muscle suit. It was just a set of pecs and, and abs, and he could pull it on, and it just gave him about an inch extra space in the front. And when you touch the front of his suit, he looked like he was, felt like he was totally ripped underneath the suit. And if you did, if you wanted to put a cooling vest, you just took off that that ab shirt, and then you could put the cooling vest in, and it was the same amount of space. Yeah. You want to try to push the door? They might have gone to the other door already. Come in! I'm not that evil. Hello. Welcome. Got any requests for any really electronic ones? Hey. Uh, I get them occasionally. Um, I don't like doing electronics. My husband's actually an electronic engineer, so no. whenever I do have electronic questions, I usually cry to him and he gives me math equations and I cry. <laughs> um, LEDs and fans is usually as far as yes. I go. I'm working with my husband to make like a blinky ear movie suit, but it's coming along really slowly because the last thing he wants to do after a whole work day is to come home and do work. So maybe yeah, when yeah. he retires. <laughs> you have to use servos and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all servos. And for, you know, a servo, servo will only do one movement. So if you want the ear to do this plus this plus this, you have to get at least three servos, right? So. Then it's, they also do off of the Nico years here that actually do some of that stuff too. Yeah, and uh, blinking, you can get away with one servo, but if you want the thing to do more than one movement, you have to add more servos and mm -hmm. then it's... Another one to actually Then you at. have to find space in the head for the servos. Some, one interesting thing you should look into is muscle wires. Oh, where you do the piano wire thing no. and it goes to another area? No, muscle wires. It's, it looks like a, it kind of looks like a, a braided cord. And depending on what length you want, what it is, it actually when you let an electrical current through it, it shrinks. Oh, and when you when the current stops, it goes back. Oh, I think I know what you're talking. Yeah, about. they call them muscle wires, mm -hmm. and they're very lightweight, and they're not supposed to make a lot. Of, they're supposed to make very little amount of heat. Mm -hmm. And so that would be a nice, easy way to do something like that for some of the small, smaller, smaller details. Yeah, I don't know. servos are the only thing I know. Obviously. Well, I'm just telling. Oh, I'm like, like, hey, that's cool. It's new on me. I'm <laughs> To get back to the it, but it's not. But, <laughs> but it's a. It's not particularly cheap. But I'm letting you know it's out there. It will help with the weight. You know, so and space too. Big deal because the servos. You know, your average servo is still about that big. Yeah. And then, not to mention a battery pack to power that yeah, one know. servo. <laughs> Done the uh, scale models, different things. I also do some uh, robotics once in a while for hobby when I have the extra cash. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to get into it. There's actually like some kind of, it's not a tech shop, but it's a Canadian equivalent of a tech shop. Mm -hmm. And it's literally an electronics warehouse where you can go and play. So I might be doing that at some point to learn more about it. But at this point, electronics are like LEDs and fans. Well, I mean, I mean particularly the fans, and the best thing I've uh, seen is on those things is actually putting like a, res a variable resistor in there for the fan. Mm -hmm. You're talking about that? Yeah. Hacker space in Calgary? Yeah, or it's, I don't know, it's up in the northeast somewhere? I don't yeah, I've, I've been there. Yeah, it must be this. We're probably talking about the same thing. I'm yeah, thinking. I think so. <laughs> yeah, the, did you, no, the Maker Fair, it was. Uh, yeah, they before. had a big thing at Maker Fair. It's, yeah. yeah, it must be the same place. They've got like an open house on Tuesdays or something. Yep. You can yep. go, <laughs> go play. I just want to look at their 3D printers. <laughs> <laughs> Someone, Maker tell me how to do things. <laughs> Any other questions? Actually, it makes me uh, wonder, um, 3D printers, um, how soon do you think um, a lot of personal makers will start uh, getting 3D printers in there how, how for, for like uh, making claws, horns, or other things that you want to... The uh, only problem I've seen with many 3, 3D printers, because me and my roommate were talking about this, is some of the pla many of the plastics are kind of fragile, and so you have to be kind of watching out for exactly what 3D printer you use. Yeah, um, they're, they're not cost effective yet. Not yet. Um, the 3D printers that are on the market that are affordable, yeah, the plastic is cheap and 
crappy. And they also have that banding issue. If you've ever seen a 3D printed object, it's got all those lines in it. Yeah. There is another machine that it's like a pool of liquid plastic and it lifts the object out. Those apparently are like sculpted perfect. Like there's no lines or anything, but the price for them is ungodly expensive. It's just not. Yeah, it's, it's not feasible, you know, yet. monetarily yet. Oh, the other know. ones actually do full layer by layer printing, and you actually have to pull the actually the, the object out from. You're the door guy. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there a door stop? Hello. Yeah. No. So one of the doors open. Hello. I, they probably should have unlocked both doors. Hi. Yeah. You want to come join us? Guest of honor, meet and greet. Oh, what? Guest of guest of honor, meet and greet. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh! I thought there was a fursuit event. Um, not here. It's the fursuit yeah, first making uh, event. And oh. This is the... Yes. She's <laughs> the first thing in I don't know. There's a, pan oh, thank you. Thank you. There's a panel after this, and then I'm back here. I thought right there was now. a fursuit meet and greet thing. That's what I got. Oh, no, I don't think that's. I don't think that's either today, yeah. or I don't think that's until later. I'm yeah, sorry to have interrupted you. Yeah, that's cool. I have my suit now. That's what these things are for. <laughs> Who reads that? <laughs> I actually, well, I actually print off the entire schedule for it. I just wanted to get in the first seat and have fun. Well, I'm sure you can go around anywhere and try to get set. You've succeeded. Yeah. <laughs> I've succeeded. I ruined this. Oh, oh God. No, I'll leave you here. Get out. Get out. Get out. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, at this point, it's I don't see it happening for another couple of years. My husband keeps bugging me. He's like, why don't you get a 3D printer? And I'm just like, it's just not worth it yet. And it's, 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 what, what I think that's fun is I know that 3D systems and stuff, they have actually uh, 3D printers for other materials, uh, all types of metal and other stuff as well mm -hmm. that they do. But those 3D printers, some of them are about a million bucks a piece yeah. uh, to, to do like titanium. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> at that point you're almost buying it, you better have to buy a full CNC but, machine. But, but, but what you're doing there is you send in the design and you just say, hey, can you make this? And you pay for time on that machine. But, yeah, pretty much. That's right. that's the more feasible option at they this point. I think the, it'll probably be, um, they'll, once enough suitors have experimented with them, mm -hmm. Um, and shown what they could do, like Latin Vix is doing that right now. She's printing out 3D noses and melting them to acetate to get the, to get rid of the banding, and they look gorgeous. But at this point, she's still experimenting, so I doubt they'll be on the market anytime soon. So until enough people have used and experimented with them, I don't think they'll ever even be economically that feasible. They, that they improve the technology as well. Yeah, the, the faster the technology gets better and the yeah. cheaper it gets. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. you'll start seeing it, but I'll see it another, you know, the only other, years. The only option I've seen is they make another uh, a twin printing set. Each one, if I remember correctly, the printer was, it's a basically of a mold maker, and the other one has a mold filler. And so you actually can basically, uh, basically almost like print a mold, and then actually has, it has an injection system to actually mm -hmm. fill it to the proper uh, thing, to the proper setting. It's, that something, might, it's that, something that'll be experimental. That's on. been actually been out for a number of years. Before, before, before the uh, pre uh, the three D printers, so you might be able. To, that might be another option. Uh, well, with most suit making, it really comes down to someone will try something new, yeah. and then someone will go, "That's totally freaking awesome! How did you do it? How can I learn more? How can I do it too?" Like I'm one of the. There, it's starting to change now, but I was one of the first for suit makers to use ABS plastic and do vacuum forming. Okay. Um, now Latin Vixen does them, um, Atalon the Deer in the UK does them as well, but it's still it's still that experimental, do I want to invest the $500 to have or make a vacuum form machine, and <laughs> so it's, this, is, this is sort of how technology works, and we'll do something exciting and try it out, and then people will see how it works, find out if it's economically feasible, and then slowly start doing, you know, incorporating it into their making. Okay. I get your hand up. You have a question. I was just wondering if you'd, uh, as far as the 3D printers go, the uh, Form One 3D printer. It's uh, basically what you were talking about. It's got the tray liquid. It shoots oh, yeah. a laser at it. It uses <laughs> magical science beams. And <laughs> that lifts the out. thing out of the thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's a desktop model. It was uh, 
uh, Kickstarter project. I, I think it's finally hit uh, the early release stage, uh, but uh, that one brings it down, well, brings the price down considerably on what was a half million dollar machine down yeah. to a couple thousand. Um, my husband mentioned it to me a couple months ago. I showed me some videos, and it looks really cool. I can't see myself investing into it yet. Same as everyone else, it's just a matter of waiting and seeing and seeing if it's even worth it. Because sometimes the technology is totally sweet, but it's just not worth it to spend the money on something that other easier, cheaper technologies do just as good. So and it's changing so quick now too. Exactly. You don't want to invest technology in a year is. Later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I spoiled that. <laughs> if you have any questions, just firing on them. <laughs> Oh, for the molds, do you carve the molds out by hand for the vac forming or? Yeah, for vac forming, um, I use either cellu clay or uh, paper clay, and I'll sculpt the shape I want. And it, uh, the thing with vacuum forming is it has to be hot, uh, something that can take the heat, and it has to be a hard, rigid, solid piece. Um, unlike doing resin stuff where it can be like a soft clay. It has to be hot, hard and, and, and uh, heat resistant enough, otherwise you'll put the plastic on and your, your sculpture will melt with the plastic and it'll be ruined. So yeah, I, I have a series of hard head molds and those have to be repaired constantly too because you do about five or six of them and then the, even, even the heat on those will start to degrade the paper clay or you'll, you know, you'll pop the head out and some of the, the mold will come with it and you'll be like, ah. Oh. <laughs> so you have to fix bits. If you want me to machine them out of something more rigid, I can do that. Oh, uh, no, I'm, I'm good for now. <laughs> I'm actually starting to phase off of vacuum forming. I still like it, and I still like doing it because it's super fast and cheap. Like, yep. I have a head, whereas resin is like me standing there rolling a thing for 20 minutes going, I'm so hungry and I have to pee, but I can't <laughs> stop until this thing is fully cured. So, um, but it's limited because the plastic thinness and the height of the mold uh, yeah, restrict mold. how how what can and cannot be vacuum formed. What can, what first uh, breeds can be vacuum formed? Um, cats are the easiest. Birds you can pretty much vacuum form anything depending on how big your vacuum form machine is. Mine's twelve by eighteen, so it's not that big, but it's big enough that you can put a head that's about this wide around on the thing. You have to make sure that all of the holes of the vacuum form machine are exposed. Like, there has to be holes exposed all the way around the shape. If you don't have those holes exposed, the, the plastic won't seal to the entire mold that you want. And if it's of a certain height, the plastic gets thinner as you stretch it over the piece. So if it's too tall, it'll rip and break. So wolves are about the tallest I can do. My mold's about that high, so a little make, less than a foot, like maybe 10 I'm guessing inches. you make front and you make another one for the back. No, actually, I don't make a back. I just make a front, and then the back is an elastic, and it's either the back of your head or I'll stick in some padding if it needs to be filled out for some reason. Yeah, I, for the most part, any realistic head, resin, or ABS, I don't put a back on. It's very cool that way. That way you just have a thing in the front of your head and the entire top of your head and the back of your head is just fur. And then so, how's it work? How's it help for the vision? Um, well, vision is, shouldn't really make a difference anyways. Uh, realistic heads always have crappier vision than toony heads, but that's mostly because of the way animal heads are shaped. Yeah. So you'll have your screens you know, off to the sides. You can never see directly in front of you. You can only sort of see off to the sides which has its pluses and minuses. You obviously can't see in front of you, but you do get this great motion when you're walking because you sort of walk and turn your head. <laughs> no, so you can constantly see in front of you. I, I had a really good sway when I had my triceratops because I'd walk and I'd sway and I'd, I could constantly see in front of me because I had that head bob just because well, I was totally blind awesome. directly in front. I could see great over there and great over there. I am Boy, sold. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> One thing you need is like some kind of like sound effect you engage every time you take sound like. <laughs> yeah, I get those those monster feet. Yeah, get, get, those, get those monster feet and mounted it. Get the magnetism out and put mounted in that. that we're would be joking about that in Red Line. We're like, we need to get like whoopee cushions on our feet and walk up and down the Red Line because that sort of smells after it's yeah. you know in line. <laughs> oh, and I'm like, that'd be the greatest idea if we didn't have to refill whoopee cushions after they deployed. It. <laughs> we'll figure something out. Oh, oh, the uh, so the, 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 the moon shoes. 
It looked like more cushions, but it's actually a soundboard. Oh, there you yeah. go. Uh, the, 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 the moon shoes they sell for kids or whatever. Oh, uh, those those moon boots. Yeah, so, so, so you just make sure that the whoopee cushion is secured to the bottom of the trampoline <laughs> part. So as soon as you step it, yes. You know, It'll get kind of a like bellows, bellows, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> plans for next year. Put a spring in your step. Oh, there you go. Oh, and then it can be I'm sorry, I couldn't help. Oh. You set that up. And then it'll be a skunk or something, too. Oh, oh. <laughs> yes. Does Victory Rich, sure have it like in some kind of output and then the wreck my little tail says back off? <laughs> I have to stop talking to people. They keep giving me great ideas for next year. <laughs> you, you, you don't know my email address, then. I, they come to me constantly. I, I've, I've, I got a, I've got a farting skunk and Vikings uh, for next year. <laughs> I'm set. <laughs> Stop putting ideas in my brain. It's horrible. They'll explode. <laughs> Anything else? Um, I was going to ask actually because I went and bought, I got my first suit uh, just like a year ago and whatnot. I bought mine used because. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the cheap way to go. <laughs> 700 bucks to learn how to take care of a student and everything, but I've been busy with life and haven't learned how to take care of it. So <laughs> my question is, what should I look for out of the first student here to say, hi, I'd like to rehabilitate this suit. It's not badly damaged, but I don't know, you know what's good or bad or whatever. And uh, what would probably be a, uh, what would be a good way to proceed with something like that? I don't know if there's any individual parts or um. resewing seams. It really depends on the suit. Uh, the best way to gauge for an artist would be to actually take a look at it. Mm -hmm. So I'd suggest taking a bunch of photos of the suit. Okay. If there's areas you specifically have a problem with, like, oh, you know, this looks crooked, or this feels gross, or, you know, mm -hmm. I think the fur is coming, you know, shedding on the paws or something, and I can the see crotch the, ripped out. And I can see the backing, or, <laughs> yeah, oh, the yeah, it ripped out. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a feature of the body. <laughs> um, it's a good idea to just take, either, either put it on and take photos, or just take photos of freestanding. If there's like a stitching issue, turn it inside out and take a photo of what you want fixed. Okay. Um, sometimes they'll take a look at the photo and go, you'd have to remake the whole body. Sometimes they'll be like, oh yeah, I can just replace that panel. Like sometimes it's, it's it's easy fix. It's just oh this this matty black fur is really gross, and they can go oh well, it's just a front chest piece. I can just cut that out and, and grab a new piece of black fur and put it in. Like there's no no work involved. Cool. So a ton of photos is the way to go. Um, check what the maker's uh, website says. Some of them do refurb, some of them don't. Okay. Um, be polite when you email them. Just tell them what you're after. Try to be as detailed as possible. You know, I I want this. I want this fixed, or this is my problem. I'd like, you know, I'd I'd like to get this refurbed, and they can uh, they can either say yes or no, or I can do it, but it's going to take you six months or that sort of thing. So, the sure. best way to get any any artist is read their web page for the love of God. First thing you do, because nine times out of ten, I get people asking me the same damn question that's on my web page like three times. Why didn't you read my web page? <laughs> Or they'll, they'll email me with something like, I need a suit for a con. And I'll be like, well, okay, what's the suit and what's the con? Like, I can't help you unless you give me the information. Do as specific yes. as you possibly can. Yes. Yep. Awesome. So what is your FAQ? Um, it's on my webpage. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think my FAQ is. actually mentions any reverbs. Some artists won't but they'll still do them. So if they don't say anything about something they do, just politely ask, do you do refurbishments or do you do repairs? And they'll either say yes or no. If they say no, leave them alone. If they say yes, great. Here's some photos, here's what I want fixed, here's what the problem. And awesome. they'll give you a timeline and a price. Cool, well, good job. Oh yes, and if you can find the fur, it saves them so much time. Like if. I've had people come up to me, they're like, can you refurb this head? And I'm like, okay, but can you find that brown? Like, Where does it come I, from? Am I gonna waste like a month looking for this exact brown only to find out it went out of print six years ago? Would you be willing to use a different brown? Like if someone did the legwork and said, okay, this is the person who made it, I think they got the fur from this website, it saves you so much time. It'll actually probably save you money because a lot of artists will charge for the legwork fee. <laughs> okay. So if you uh, if you look uh, locate all the fur or fur you want, 
and kind of the prizes and locations, it helps a lot. Yeah, the more the more you can offer the artist, they'll appreciate it so much, just because it's that less work they have to do. Um, you can also offer to, if you find the fur, find the person who made the suit and has some extra fur that you can buy off of, yeah. you can just tell the artist, I can send you the fur. And, and that saves them a ton of time, and they might give you a discount because they didn't have to buy it. And, and actually, the maker of the suit is actually here at RM, so it's kind oh, of, it's it, it is, it's even easier. It's just she and I have been doing this for the oh, schedules yeah. so far. <laughs> we both got here yesterday, and we saw each other from across the lobby, and then we both back around. I'm like, yeah, that's RM. Right. <laughs> that's every con. I'll go to cons, and I'll be like, I didn't see you once. And they're like, oh, I was here. Oh, I was there. Every single time. Or what happened last year, you walked past me twice. <laughs> I'm sorry, I walked past and went, boy, that looked like Royce, and then I kept going. <laughs> Remy did it to me this year, so it's totally okay. We're like, hey, Remy, keeps walking, hey, Remy, Remy, hey. <laughs> and then later we walk past, he's like, hey, guys, I'm like, you dick. <laughs> he's like, what? We said hi like six times, and he's like, oh, I heard someone, but I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Classy. <laughs> so the more material you can purchase beforehand and then send it to the uh, fur maker is always best? It's a big help. Also, fur goes out of print. So it's one of those, say if you wanted a maker to make you a head now and a body later, if you offered to buy all the fur now or let the artist know that I'd like to commission a body later, they may buy extra fur because fur goes out of print or they'll do another print run of the same fur, but the dye lot will change slightly. So it'll be there'll be subtle differences even in the same fur from the same company yeah. or the same shop. So if you can buy it all at the same time, that saves them time. And that's that's what I was thinking. Is if either I'm going to make one myself or have one made. Yeah, and so. it never hurts. You know, you know when you might need to do repairs, it's good to always have. Yes, yeah, I was planning on buying a lot of it, just have more than needed just in case. Mm -hmm. Alright. So speaking of fur and fur matching, um, I recently made my first suit for a friend and I needed a different length of fur and I have my base and I was, do you know of anybody that sells fur that you could send a sample to and say, hey, do you have this color in this length? Uh, or do you know if anybody does it? Because everybody goes, we'll give you four samples for a dollar. I'm like, that's fine, but you carry 22 browns. <laughs> Um, and my computer monitor invariably. The yeah. only uh, fur company I've ever had any luck with either color matching or having them go the extra mile is I'm Stuffed Fur. Um, I contacted them because I was looking for a green for a dragon and finding short pale green fur is the biggest pain. They only have super, super dark and olive green and that's it. And he wanted like a grass green and I'm going, so I really, and so I contacted I'm Stuffed Fur and just politely said, I'm looking for a short pile green. Do you have any more? Because they might not have all of their stock on their webpage. And I said, oh yeah, we have another green. I'm like, could you send me a swatch? Sure, no problem. So yeah, like a week later, and it was like, this is the green. Like, if I hadn't have asked, I'd have never known because it wasn't on their webpage. But they did have it. You can also, you know, sit, like just click a photo and just say, I'm looking for a brown around this color. And they may go, I've got a few swatches that might work, and then say, would you like to pay for the swatches? You still have to order the swatches, but at least they can help do the legwork. I'm Stuffer is the only company I've known that's done that for me. Okay. Um, NFT probably would, but you're also paying through the nose because that's the big fancy schmancy Hollywood fur company. How much does a uh, standard fur suit fur run in terms of its cost? Um, it'll depend, because I live in Canada, everything costs more. Um, 25 bucks is a good low price for fur. Um, I paid, a foot? No, per meter, or yard. Oh, for, uh, <laughs> for a square yard? Yeah, uh, not a square yard. Um, fur, uh, uh, NFT aside, let's not talk about them anymore. Uh, most fur comes in big rolls of, of fur fabric. Mm -hmm. um, a roll is 60 inches long. Okay. And then it's however long in meters they'll roll it out and cut that for you. Okay. So if you wanted two yards, you'd get two yards that are 60 inches wide. So almost uh, two yards wide. 
Or, yeah, I'm well about that. Yeah, <laughs> so about two yards wide by. But if so, that would actually a yard would actually be two square yards. <laughs> oh God, you're talking math, and it's not. It's American. I'm from <laughs> Canada here. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, in Canada we use meters. <laughs> but yes, the, the well, idea meters is. meters and yards are close enough. They're, they're close yeah, enough. They're off by about an inch and a half. Yeah. No, normally when I when I order from the U.S., if I need a meter, I'll order a yard. It's just as good. Um, but uh, yeah, 60 inches is the average. It's a good idea to check, like if you buy fur on SD, they often sell what's called a fat quarter. A fat quarter is, met, it's, a, it's a quilting term. A fat quarter is, I think, 18 inches by like 12 inches or something. So it's just a chunk. So you'll go on SD and go, what a great price for a beautiful fur. And then they'll send it to you and be like, this is all I get? <laughs> yeah, because it said fat quarter and you weren't paying attention. Yeah, a fat quarter is technically a quarter of a yard of quilting fabric, which is 44 inches yeah. by 36. So, so divide that. Like, I see a quilter. I'm not. <laughs> no? Did you just not? I've done that. So, 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 <laughs> I bought a fat quarter in instead of a yard. Yeah, no, we've all done that at least once. <laughs> <laughs> The most I've paid for fur is about 56 bucks. Um, 20, 25 bucks is pretty average. Um, I don't balk at paying 30 to 40 dollars for fur if it's good. How many yards of fur would you say are required for your average fur suit? Um, I'm 5'3", 140 pounds. I can make a fur suit, a full fur suit, feet, hand, paws, tail, head, everything, like a wolf or something, for three yards. Three yards. So, so that's like one color. <laughs> one color. But, so if you were going to make, so basically about a hundred dollars for the fur if you're going to make your own fur suit. At least. A hundred to a hundred. Um, I, I don't, I'm going to say two hundred just because there's those just in case oops moments where you realize screw you, up something and you, have you to. cut the fur in the wrong direction or you made something and it looks totally awful and you have to remake it again. Um, two hundred safe. Um, so basically but, 125 to 200 is the range you'd say for the fur itself? Yeah, pretty much. What other materials do you usually need in terms of um, making it and what's the price range? Depends what you choose to do. Um, paw pads, um, those can be made of silicone, rubber latex, vinyl, fleece, those are pretty common. Um, if you're going silicone, you can, like there's a lot of companies that make them for your vision creations. I think more uh, they sell a silicone paw pad. You can just, you know, I think it's like 30 bucks. And it's just a cast paw pad, whatever color you want. A silicone. So those are really just, you just cut them out and glue them on. Um, fleece and vinyl, if you want like a puffy paw pad, more of a tootie style. Uh, those ones you sew directly onto the fur and stuff with polyfilm and sew it up and you get a nice squishy tootie paw pad. Um, you know, I, Tongues and teeth, it depends on what you go with. Uh, their makers, like I said, Division Creations, uh, for supplies.com, supplies uh, Carnet FX, they make teeth and tongues. You can also get taxidermy supplies. They make jaw sets and tongues out of silicone and resin. Uh, you can also make teeth out of Sculpty, like just go to the craft store and get that oven baked clay. Um, can I give a word out for mm -hmm. Magic Sculpt if you haven't heard of it? It's oh, a is that that? part of Poxy. Um, it doesn't require heating and is practically destruction proof and it's nearly heat proof too. So there's, yeah, there's, there's a few of those. more expensive, but it lasts way longer than most of the other ones. Yeah, Sculpty will fall apart. It'll break or it'll, it'll drop off. Yeah, epoxies, um, those are the things where you get like two types of things and you squish them together and then you have like five minutes to mold no, it into the thing you want before it hardens. <laughs> It depends on the material. Well, um, I usually yeah, use that plumbing putty, and that stuff that is literally, nice. it's like, oh god, I have five minutes, no! And then it heats up, and it, when it heats up, you know it's curing, you're like, no! <laughs> Which I found that you can sculpt that stuff with a drum. You can, really well. yeah. Any, any of those can. hard epoxies, if you do totally screw up, you can use a Dremel or sandpaper and like fix bits. So it's not a total waste. I'm just trying to drive by the door open. <laughs> <laughs> Get your little bellhop hat. Exactly. <laughs> um, Actually, where you could put a sign on things is use other norm. That, that could work too. 
But why would we use such crazy logical things here? It's very bad. Uh, uh, and then you know, someone like me is going to slap another stuff at the other door that says door of order. <laughs> I would do that as well. These guys. Um, so aside from fur, um, assorted fabrics. Um, you might want to use fabric for the interior of the ears. Um, pop pads, like I said. Um, I like to make tongues out of fleece. You basically just sew a little U and then sew a line in the middle for the. So that's just a little bit of fleece. Um, depending on what you line your fursuit head with, um, if you do like a balaclava style, then you'll need some spandex lycra. Um, felt, if you want to go with the tunie suit, a lot of people, the tunie eyes and the eyebrows, those are with felt. So assorted fabrics. If you have a fabric card to your local fabric store, it will come in handy. <laughs> I think your Hobby Lobbies have an assortment of fabrics, don't they? Yeah, but I don't really like to support Hobby Lobby. Uh, <laughs> we would have them in Canada. Well, basically, <laughs> Michael's they, is they, our They've been big on uh, sending political <laughs> contributions to the um, anti-gay marriage campaigns. Fair enough. No Hobby Lobby for you. You're just going to have to find generic fabric store number six. That's <laughs> but what I was asking, basically, <laughs> it, what would basically be a rough estimate of the total cost involved for materials if I was to try to make an average fursuit? Um, 250 to 300 dollars is pretty average if you make it to your own suit. And that's with the extra oops fabric. The oops fabric. <laughs> oops factor. The oops factor. But and you can get a lot of stuff at dollar stores too. Like all of my 2 eyes. Dollar store garbage cans. <laughs> uh, and assuming, what, what kind of equipment do you need other than a sewing machine? Hot glue gun. Hot glue gun. Uh, needle and thread. Um, good pair of scissors. Good pair of scissors and an Ulfa knife. One of Ulfa those, knife? yeah, one of those like retractable blade ones. Ulfa is the big company, the yellow and black. You mean like that? The, the, the reta oh, retractable blade? exacto no, knife. Not switch blade, snap blade. Oh, snap. That's yes, yeah, snap blade. Sorry. Ulfa. Uh, I don't uh, want to <laughs> gangster on the first suit. <laughs> cut you. Man, I you. No, <laughs> actually, so, uh, you want to know how I got these scars? <laughs> oh god, I got so, um, Would like a box opener work, or would that not be sharp enough? Box, oh, opener. box opener. Yes, okay. a box opener is a retractable blade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I prefer the skinny ones. We can get the big, thick ones too. Those are good for if you're cutting big, thick pieces of fat, uh, foam. So basically, if I had all those um, tools. And, I'd only have to spend about three hundred dollars to get the base materials for it. Pretty much, it was probably a little less than three hundred. Like I said, it depends that on the fabric. Factor. If if you bought like really gorgeous, you know, super fur that was like fifty bucks per meter, then yeah. yeah. But if you're buying a nice twenty-five dollar, yeah, two fifty, three hundred bucks. That's actually a lot cheaper than I would have thought. It's significantly cheaper. It's one of those things where if you. It's the labor that's you're, getting you. The labor that the labor gets you. This is why suits cost money. Is the labor. It takes a really long time. You're, you're paying for the experience, and you're paying for someone to sit and do the work. That's that's the whole kicker. That's kind of sometimes you just buy the materials and send it to them. So at least you're only paying for the labor. Yeah, some some suit makers will do that. If you um, if you want to have the suit made, you can email them and say, "Would you offer a discount if I provide my own?" And a lot of them will say, sure, I'll waive the 30% deposit. Because most, most of the time, if they have a deposit to put you on the queue, that money is going towards the materials. materials. materials yeah. So they, they'll either waive that fee or they'll you know, take off 100 or 200 bucks. They may not take it all off because, like I said, if you're just providing the fur, they still have to provide the silicone and the resin and the, you know, the, the acrylic cabotrons oh, those, or whatever, those... whatever they choose to use to make the other little bits and bobs of the suits like eyes and nose and pop hats and claws and sort of things, but the fur is the biggest expenditure in making any suit. What would be the second, other than, this, other than the dirt and the, the meant labor? Depends on the suit maker, but chemicals for me is the second most expensive. Silicones and resins. Those are, you know, you buy the big gallon jug and it's like, oh, it's 150 how bucks. The, how many of the chemicals are volatile and like uh, bad with fumes? All of them? <laughs> if so, they smell, they're bad for you. And every chemical smells. The only thing it's not. of them are actually explosive? None of mine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Breaking fur. Um, 
I don't know if you make hers and eyes. I used to. I don't need more. Can you direct me to someone that I can learn or learn from? Uh, live journal, the fursuit channel. Uh, search under. Uh, they, they have. They've been broken down into sections. They've got one on just eyes. And I think even I've got a tutorial in there on how to make the, the follow me eyes. Um, I almost suggest going with a cabochon. Those are, you go to Tap Plastics, you buy an acrylic half dome, it's called a cabochon. I learned something, it was so cool. I'm like, it has a name. <laughs> um, uh, clear resin is very volatile. It stinks for a week. It is so toxic. I don't make them anymore for that particular reason. It's yeah, like, I have the supplies. <laughs> um, you'll you'll learn you'll probably learn the most from there, but unfortunately, a lot of resin casting is um, is trial and error. Anyone who's good at it won't share their trade secrets. Um, I can suggest a few things. Uh, when you mix it up and pour in the molds, you'll find those little bubbles. You need to make a vacuum chamber. Vacuum chambers are a lot easier to make than they sound. It's basically a box to put the resin in with a hole cut in the top, stick your vacuum in it, and turn the vacuum on. It will suck all the little bubbles out. <laughs> um, it, it sounds super scary. It's like, oh god, I have to make a vacuum chamber. This is sci-fi, fantastic. It's, yeah, it's super easy. Um, that's the, probably the most important thing when working with clear resin is getting rid of those little bubbles. Um, also, depends where you live, humidity and temperature are the biggest factors to curing resin. Um, most resin won't cure unless it's about 25 degrees Celsius. So yeah, I, I, I do all my resin casting in the summer. I just do this like massive resin cast and I'll like make a ton of stuff so I'm set for the winter. And humidity is a huge factor. Do you live in Seattle? Get a, humidif a dehumidifier. Mm -hmm. I live in Calgary. It's very, very dry in Calgary, so I don't have to worry about the humidity. But it, I, I had some of my resin got contaminated with some water, and it just bubbled and ruined. And it, it, moisture of any type will ruin your resin. So you have to have it dry, and it has to be warm. All right, we got like five minutes left. So anyone wants to fire any more questions at me? Where are some good places to get fur? Um, since I'm in Canada, I'm a little more limited because they, some places won't ship to Canada. Uh, distinctive fabrics is where most people go. That's why when they say DF fur, they're referring to distinctive fabrics. Um, I like Mendel's Far Out Fabrics. M-E-D-E-L-S. Um, I'm Stuff Fur. That's one of my favorites because they have really nice realistic furs. Um, interior malls, not bad, but their shipping is really slow. Uh, and the rest of my furs are mostly local. Oh, Fabric Empire, they're very good too. They have, a, they have an eBay store, but they also have an actual store store. They have some really beautiful furs there too. But it's a lot of digging. Like it's, it's one of those, it's like, I would like a long fur. So you go to the long fur section and then they're like all broken up into sections. You can't just look at all of the fur. You have to click on the curly mango, magnolia or Mongolian lamb fur. And then they've got like a Mongolian goat fur. And you're just like, what's the difference? <laughs> or they'll have some and it'll be like, this one's got lavender stripes and this one's got pink stripes. They put them in different sections. So you literally have to go through each thing to find that one fur. Mm -hmm. So the narrow, uh, the narrow type of fur is called quarter short, right? Or Fat quarter. Fat quarter, okay. Yeah. So if you so, see that, you don't want it because it's. Okay, it's, so if it's, it's not fat quarter, it should be 60 inches long by standard. Yeah, by standard. There's the occasional version there that is. may be different, but 60 inches, it just is pretty much the standard for almost any bolt of fur. Ask if they don't list yeah. the counter length. They, they, should have a, they should have a, most websites will have a length, and it'll say 60 inches, 45 inches. But most furs I've ever bought have always been. Anything else? I guess that's it. Thank you for coming. <laughs>